Hello, this is Graphic Policy Radio. This is your host, Elana Levin, aka Twitter's Elana Brooklyn. And this is a podcast that believes you can be whoever, whatever you want to be, even someone good, even a really good alligator. That's right. Today's topic is Loki, the new Marvel Disney Plus show. And uh, I, you know, these Marvel Disney Plus shows are a cultural moment in which a lot of people who I don't normally have the opportunity to invite onto the show, um, sometimes I'll stumble upon them saying smart things in social media or in my communications with them. And I'll realize, oh, shit, they've been watching this show, too. Perhaps now is the opportunity to lure them into the Graphic Policy Radio podcast and get to talk with them about this topic. And that is what happened to me when just the other week there I was looking at the Twitters and Julia Serrano, who is a massively influential queer intellectual, um, had been sharing some of her thoughts about Loki, particularly about queerness in the show and trans identity. And I was like, please come on the show, please come on the show. And lo and behold, Julia said yes. So Julia Serrano is joining me as a first time guest on the show. She is an Oakland, California based writer, performer, biologist and activist. She is best known for her nonfiction books, Whipping Girl, A Transsexual Woman on Sexism and the Scapegoating of Femininity and Excluded, I'm sorry, and Excluded, Making Feminist and Queer Movements More Inclusive. Julia's first foray into fiction, entitled 99 Erics, a Cat Cataclysm Faux Novel, won the Publishing Triangle's 2021 Edmund White Award for Debut Fiction and was an Independent Publisher Book Awards 2021 Silver Medalist in LGBT plus fiction. This book is a humorous account of a bisexual female absurdist short fiction writer who dates 99 different people named Eric for literature's sake. It is more surreal than slutty, not that there's anything wrong with slutty. And you can check that out and more at Julia Serrano, which is S-E-R-A-N-O dot com. Welcome to the show, Julia. Hi there. Thank you for having me. I was so glad when you like responded to me, a random person on the internet, saying, "Please talk Loki with me." <laughs> no, I'm I'm excited too, and uh, um, I'm, I'm glad that I saw your message because there was definitely a lot of comments on that. I definitely uh, <laughs> uh, resonated with some people, but maybe uh, for some people, a little too close to the bone or a little too, uh, yeah. So anyway. Um, I'm very glad that uh, yeah. you responded and we're talking. Yeah, I'll link I'll link to the Twitter thread in the show notes for anybody who might have missed it. And and um and you know you said that you were a big fan of the MCU uh, universes and have really watched a, a lot of the the movies and films. Wait, that's the same thing. The movies and TV shows. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And so I would describe myself, I guess, particularly in a podcast like this, as I'm probably more of a a casual fan in that I. Um, have never really gotten into the comic books and the the lore behind it, but I've enjoyed a lot of the MCU movies. Um, I've watched the last three Disney Plus shows, including Loki, and, um, you know, definitely got into it. I was listening to some podcasts and explainer videos, and that was kind of when I felt like there was something that I had to say regarding uh, the Loki, Sylvie, uh, romance. I don't know if it's a romance, but a relationship. connection relationship. Yeah. yeah. God damn it. It's a romance. It's a romance. <laughs> so that's great. It made me so happy to see it. And you know, our listeners, we have comics readers and non comics readers, and we really want to be like a show for people who want to talk about these things from an intellectual leftist queer standpoint, regardless of how much of the different mediums they may or may not have uh, absorbed and then coming from the like all comics all the time plugged right into the veins end of the spectrum is returning guest T Fogner. T is the editorial director for comics at King Features Syndicate. When she's not reading comics for work, she's reading comics for fun, drawing comics, dressing up as comic book characters, or watching comic adaptations on television. T is also the programming chair for FlameCon, which is the world's largest LGBTQ comic convention and like one of my absolute favorite queer spaces to be. Welcome back, T. Thank you, Alana. It's so great to be here. I'm really excited to talk about Loki. Question, have you cosplayed as Loki before? Uh, Actually, have I cosplayed as Loki? No, I haven't cosplayed as Loki. I've cosplayed with somebody cosplaying as Loki. Um, but I haven't cosplayed as Loki myself. Who were you with Loki? Do you remember? Um, Namor. Oh my God. Yes. 
So, so yeah. Yeah. yeah um, <laughs> one of my friends and I, for fl- a FlameCon after party one year, we were Club Kid, Loki, and Namor. Those two would be really fun to party with. It was a super fun costume. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I, I feel like at this point, I'd want to do a real quick, like, consensus that we think this is a, sh- we overall, this is like the, the two second spoiler free section of the podcast. Like, we, we, this was a good show. We think people who enjoy this sort of media should watch it, as opposed to my opinion of uh, last show, Winter Soldier, which is terrible and no one should watch it. Um, right. So <laughs> do, do people generally feel generally positively towards Loki? Like, endorse, check out the show? I definitely very much enjoyed it. I I think of the three shows, this was the one I felt like every episode, it went someplace that I wasn't expecting. And um, it was just a very overall enjoyable show that I felt really held together, even though people can quibble about certain aspects of it. But I very much enjoyed it as a show. Yeah. Yeah, I I agree with Julia. Like, there's a couple things that I, you know, from if I'm being super critical, I might be like, "Uh, that didn't really work for me. But overall, I I felt like I felt like it was probably the most solid of the MCU shows on Disney Plus so far. Um, It's got a plot that goes somewhere. Uh, It's got really relatable characters. And um, and other than the lighting, I, I, you know, I don't have any major complaints. (laughs) And it has real style up the wazoo. And I I also felt like, I mean, I don't want to jump too much into this piece of the convo, although I know this will actually be a ton of the convo, but I like, it did give me queer feelings, which is more than I can say for a lot of things that have come out of this corporate universe. So if, if you are considering whether or not to watch Loki, uh, go for it. And then come back and listen to this podcast with us. Because from here on, there's just going to be 100% spoilers all the time. Just assume, we're going to assume you've seen the whole damn show. So, um, you know, one of the things that I I started with when I was thinking about this show is what an amazing gift to the MCU Tom Hiddleston's performance was. And like to this entire series and that it all was because Kenneth Branagh, like Shakespearean director, directed Thor and got got a say in who got cast. Because what a let this this would not have happened otherwise. Do you know what I mean? Like it's true though. I mean the, the series has excellent casting overall. Like they thought the whole cast for this was excellent. But it is kind of amazing uh, the path to this show existing as coming from like Shakespeare theater, um, which makes sense because that was. I mean, that kind of epic storytelling was a huge influence on the comics that were the foundation of this part of the Marvel Universe. But I, I we, we also got a lot of really new and exciting performances from new actors, like a lot of Black women, finally, in the show. And um, everybody was so damn impressive. Yeah, I, I really enjoyed all of the acting across the board. Um, and especially kind of have to mention the Jonathan Majors who like really (laughs) I've never seen somebody exposition for about 20 minutes or 30 minutes I don't know how long that was that he was just talking and telling us the backstory yeah yeah and yet it was so uh engaging and um just yeah pretty amazing yeah, I'm excited to see where they take his character um because I've heard that he's going to be um, continuing on in the next Ant-Man and the Wasp movie. Um, mm-hmm. I also loved um, Winmi Masaku as uh, Hunter B-15. I thought she was fantastic. Uh, I wish that character had been given more to do, uh, and I hope we see more of her, because I just absolutely loved her, for her performance as kind of the, like, completely put-upon bureaucrat who starts uncovering what's going on and like takes things into her own hands. I just thought she was wonderful. And I'll come back to Jonathan Majors, AKA Kang, but I just want to say that I am very convinced that B15 and C20 were a couple in real life before they got declared variants and sucked into the dystopia. That is very interesting. I hadn't like made that connection before, but if, if or when when I rewatch it, I will definitely look out for that. I hadn't even occurred to me. 
The reason I thought them as such is because, you know, the, the memory loop that they visit um, C20 in um, where she's in the bar and Sylvie is like sort of occupying her memory of an experience. I feel like Sylvie is putting herself in the position of another woman who she's talking to at the bar. And if this was the last moment that um, this person had before she got sucked into like oh my god you're a variant you know now we have to take you out of the timeline uh then maybe it was her conversation with another person who was also getting sucked out of the timeline and it just felt to me like these are two women talking at a bar and there's like some sort of romantic tension in there and that that's the reason why that's my little personal theory about those two yeah i definitely felt the romantic tension in that bar scene but i didn't really Put connect that to B15, but Alana, I will really be very happy to read your fanfic. <laughs> well, that, you've heard it now. That's about as far as it's gotten, but I, I like actually think I'm right. I tend not to be a big theories person, but this was one of the moments that I was like, you know, um, but yeah, like the, 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 uh, we really did get like a whole, a whole amazing splash of, of new cast and characters. And what, one of the things that was sort of interesting to me was, you know, the TVA in some ways is positioned as a workplace and it has, it has some of the whole like, your workplace is your family. And then realizing actually that's not true and not okay. A realization in this that I think a lot of people might be wrestling with in real life now in their own lives. Uh, I felt like that was a theme that the show really picked up as well. Yeah, I feel like of all the mcu anything this comes the close to being something you could describe as kafka-esque uh mm -hmm. because it's just got that creeping bureaucratic horror running throughout the entire thing um that just feels it you know feels very much like something from like the trial or you know in in metamorphosis when people don't really know what to do with Gregor after he turns into a bug. Um, <laughs> but that very, like, very everything has to be by the rules. And oh, no, you've now broken one of the rules. And everything is kind of dingy because it's some kind of, you know, facility where they haven't updated everything in years. One of the really interesting things that I noticed is that I think that all of the beverages they serve in the TVA are from the 90s. Mm. Um, there's Boku, which was that beverage that I think it was like the comedian Richard Lewis was in the ad yes. for. Mm -hmm. And then, um, and then, um, there's a part where, um, Mobius is drinking Josta, which is also a 90s drink. So it, there's just like these weird little details and it's just that whole dated, super bureaucratic you're stuck working in this government office where nothing ever changes feeling that i i just i thought really kind of like elevated the whole show and the uh, art direction was probably the best art direction on marvel since black panther i mean the like just looking at even the the dress shirts, the Oxford shirts that the officers or the agents are wearing, where rather than having a button down collar, the button down collar actually becomes the whole shoulder yoke. It's that kind of this is just a little bit off of how shirts work in our world, but it's evoking what you know the the what the uniform would look like in our world. It's just enough of a difference to be like if the world had varied along one specific lines, perhaps this would have been how shirts would have developed. And the entire um design for the office space, it I it's interesting because it, you might be tempted to think of it as being like, oh, it's trying to it's like, oh, it's from this exact time period or that exact time period, but it's actually really not. It is pulling some design elements from Bauhaus, it's pulling some design elements from the 70s. It's pulling some design elements from Art Deco. And it's, you know, also pulling brutalist architecture. So, and it's mushing it all together in a way where it looks like a synthesized style, but it isn't just one thing. Um, and, but it's, and it's so thought out and so holistic. I, and I loved when they have all of the animation, they brought in traditional animation to explain how the timeline works and have Miss Minutes voiced by Tara Strong, who's just really one of the best voice actresses working. Um, and just like 
the thoughtfulness in using the art direction to like really do visual storytelling and create a world um, that would not have been as much fun without it. I also really loved all of the suits that were Judge Ramonda wears and someone should buy them for me. That would be my current going theory. I think that's probably a really good thing to put up a GoFundMe for. Yeah, I think so too. Um, you know, and when you think about the dehumanization, like what is the first thing they do to Loki when they suck him up into this dystopian hell is they zap his clothing of choice off of him and put him in the uniform and process him that way. And it's interesting because like it's a moment where I know some people are like kind of like playing it for like we get to see an attractive person naked hurrah but i'm still just like like i'm not gonna have that reaction to that kind of a moment sorry i don't want them burning up my clothing either yeah in addition to that intake scene just also it is sort of weird you get used to it as the show goes on but seeing loki wearing kind of like Mm. the the shirt and tie (laughs) is very it's it's sort of surreal i mean especially when they get to uh the void And we're Mm -hmm. seeing other Lokis and all the other Lokis are wearing whatever they probably were when they were snapped up, I guess, because he's working with the TVA. He has the TVA Mm -hmm. garb on. Um, And it is sort of jarring, but you get used to it. Um, And it definitely reminds me as someone who, uh, as a trans woman, (laughs) who very clearly remembers a period of time when I was a very small kid and my dad was walking off to work and he's wearing his suit and tie. And I'm like, I can't believe you have to wear that every day. And I'm not at the time very, uh, <laughs> I'm not thinking of it in terms of uh, specifically a trans thing. In retrospect, it's a very trans thing. Cause, uh, and he's like, someday you will too. And, and so anyway, for me personally, that sort of resonated with the whole he's become a part of the TVA and he's wearing that outfit and they all have to wear those outfits. And uh, there's something dehumanizing about that too. Um, Mm. So it's interesting that you brought that up. Yeah, definitely was a scene where I felt like uh, different people had a different reaction to, to it than, than I did there. Um, I think another, I, I, but I do want to spend time talk, talking about, I think, one of the most impactful sort of scenes and, and things from the series, which was, you know, Sylvie getting, you know, getting kidnapped out of her life as a child. Um, clearly, the show establishes for the, the, for being who she is. Um, it was interesting to me because prior to that scene, you know, a lot of people had been talking online about, uh, reading Sylvie as trans or as a non-binary, you know, but Loki obviously being non-binary. Um, and I'd heard a couple of people say online, uh, after they had the flashback to seeing Sylvie as a child, then getting zap, you know, getting kidnapped out of her life. Um, oh, well, see, they just did that so we wouldn't headcanon her as trans anymore. And I was like, excuse me? There's literally nothing about showing her as a little girl that means she's not trans. And also, like, that this is just became even more even more so to me because it's implying that her deviance is simply, like, existing and living her life. You know, what could a child possibly do that would get them taken out of the timeline other than oh, you're not being who we told you to be. Like, that's extremely trans. Yeah, the thing that uh, struck me, when we see the flashback, it's unclear why they pick that particular time to snatch her. Like, it just seems like she's playing with toys. And then for me, it really got hit home, the episode where they're in the void and we meet all the other Lokis. And they're all male-bodied Lokis. And especially the there's a, a moment where um, our Loki, <laughs> for lack of a better term, um, trying is trying to explain why he's different or what he's gone through. And he's like, have any of you ever met a female version of us? And classic Loki says, sounds terrifying, <laughs> which kind of implies that <laughs> none of them are female except for Sylvie or at least a very small minority are. And which is kind of 
for one thing, from a uh, perspective that the character is supposed to be gender fluid, <laughs> that they make it at the same time seem like Sylvie is a, a very rare exception. Um, so that's maybe not good uh, gender yeah. fluid writing. Um, and then particularly, uh, I had some online conversations uh, with Noah Berlatsky, who has since written a piece that's on his Patreon, and it's uh, accessible. Anyone can look it up. It's called Sylvie Fights the TVA for LGBT Rights at Disney. And this really hit home the idea that whether consciously or unconsciously, it seems like the writers imagine Sylvie as a trans um, allegory, if not an actual trans character. Um, and one of the things that uh, Noah points out that I missed is that she's also the only Loki who doesn't call herself Loki. And not only she does she not call herself Loki, but she reacts to it kind of like a dead name, like, don't call me that. Um, and yet all the other Lokis call themselves Loki. Yes. Yeah, I, you know, it's it. one of the things that was interesting to me, too, is then there's the moment where she asks um, Judge Renslayer, you know, why, you know, why was she taken? What was the, what was her nexus event? And Renslayer says she doesn't remember. And it's this really, you know, so it becomes this really, it's really striking that they took her because she was herself um, and that they don't really have a good explanation for it otherwise. But I think the other thing um about Sylvie that felt really important to me is that she's also the one who, because of what her specific magical power is, she's the person who challenges everyone else to introspect a lot more deeply about themselves. And so, you know, and I think that that's one of those things that, um, you know, certainly for me, a lot of my coming to the realization that I was genderqueer and that um, and that was part of my identity was meeting other people who had already done that work for themselves. Um, and I think that that's a thing. I think that's a thing that you see along a lot of queer identities is you meet somebody who's done that work and then it's like, oh, I can ask these questions about myself. I can look inside myself and try to figure out who I am what these things that happened to me in my past really meant um, and then use those to move forward. And that's what Sylvie does for everyone at the TVA. Yeah, that's right. And, if, you know, for the other Lokis and certainly for the TVA in terms of questioning themselves. And that in and of itself is a really great metaphor for, yeah, her being a trans person who has done the work. I, um, one of the, I, I talked briefly with uh, Pretty Chiba, you know, the, the writer and critic um, who had said, that she would kind of wish that the casting for Mobius and Judge Ramonda had been um, switched. There were lines that um, Judge Renslayer says that she felt would have been a lot more, would have made more sense coming from a white man than from a black woman in the context of that show and the dynamics of like, oh, I'm not, a, your, your deviance is, it must have been because you're deviant, but it's also just because I, you know, can't even be bothered to remember you. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm maybe putting a little bit of words in Preeti's mouth with this because she sort of alluded to it, but I, I, I was immediately jumped on it. It's like this, that, that is true to me. I felt like it. Yeah. I remember seeing Pretty talking about that. And what's interesting is that contextually within the show, I agree to her. I agree with her to a certain degree but Ravonna Renslayer is a comic character and she's Kang's love interest. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, so that's one of those things where there so much of Kang's story in the comics is specifically about Ravonna Renslayer um, dying and him going through time and splitting timelines specifically because he's trying to find a way to save her and either find a version of her that's still alive um, in, you know, by going back in time or in one case by going into a different timeline. Uh, and so, you know, so thinking about it in perspective, in the, from the perspective of where does this character fit? Um, you know, it's a little bit, 
it's it's a little bit difficult to figure out, okay, is she going to be, you know, is her role going to be bigger? Is her role and her um, sort of involvement with Kang going to actually be part of the ongoing story in the MCU? Uh, it, there's actually a storyline where she becomes Kang. Um, she actually, Kang sort of dies and she kind of puts him in cryopreservation and pretends to be Kang for a while. So they're really accomplices, I, I think, much more deeply than um, than the show really got into. But at the same time, I think toward the end of it, it became, I at least to me, and this is as somebody who already knew the character, um, it became, uh, like, to me, I read it as she was the only one there who already knew well, what was happening. Mm -hmm. And so, so part of it is that she's, um, you know, at the end, I'm assuming that she's going to mm -hmm. find Kang. Um, but that's, you know, but I think it's hard to, you're not going to get that, that read unless you're familiar with the character. I mean, who amongst us has not pretended to be Kang at some point? Mm. <laughs> uh, Kang is where continuity goes to break itself down into its molecules, disperse and choke everyone's lungs. Like the continuity of this character could not possibly be captured, expressed or relayed. It is so just like i think you know if this was jay and miles explained the x-men like every ent you know every, every intro could be like kang what because it just makes it's very complicated <laughs> i i can do the very very quick like for reference version which is do it there is a cross time council of kangs in the comic so that tells you exactly how many kang variants there are in the comic books um, and how much they've screwed up the timeline Oof. in the comic books. Yeah. Yeah. And Jonathan Majors is, is so great in this role. I think it's a hard role to do because like, not only are you monologuing a ton, but you're, you're playing someone who's not exactly there to be relatable or, I mean, like it's, it's, it's a hard, it's a fucking hard character to do. And he was incredibly magnetic. I think I, I, I figured out that that's who he was cast as when they first announced his name. And, you know, he's everywhere now and, and with good reason. Um, so one of the other uh, big conversations around the show is just like looking at all the different ways that predestination um, and fr uh, is like the topic of this, basically, do people have free will? Is free will inherently dangerous? Um, I mean, and yes, but it's also worth it. Um, and this, and, and in a way, if you have a show about free will and that implies that everything that had happened until this point, if the people speaking are to be believed, which they might not be supposed to be believed, was all predestined, um, then you don't really have people living life at all. Um, so, you know, this is sort of a, a question that the show posits, like, has the entire Marvel Universe been essentially like a supernaturally fascist system where people didn't have the opportunity to do anything other than what had been predicted to, for them to do? Um, you know, I think it's entirely possible that uh, the Time Variance Authority didn't have as much control over what everyone was doing as they pretend to do, as most... Um, uh, most systems are not as complete self-exiled and enforced as they portray themselves to be. But, um, you know, it definitely is establishing that choice and freedom is, is dangerous. And one of the things that people were trying to shut down, people with power try to shut down. Yeah. I, I think one way of thinking through it that kind of makes sense is, <laughs> and has a lot of uh, real world implications is that all of the previous movies we saw, everybody was doing whatever they wanted to do. But if they did something that the system didn't want them to do, it wouldn't have happened. It would have been erased um, and invisibilized. And so in a sense, that's kind of what systemic structures in um, our world do, that theoretically we can do anything we want but if you cross like societal norms enough, um, either people won't let other people see what you're doing or read what you're thinking, um, or people will 
you know, you could be um, arrested and essentially uh, the real world version of being pruned from the the um, sacred timeline would be, well, you're incarcerated now. <laughs> you're We've taken you out of mm-hmm. the real world. So I definitely was thinking a lot about that as we were watching it because it makes you question, you know, and it, I think that all of the previous movies and the characters that we've watched doing the things they're doing, they did what they were doing out of what they felt was like free will. But if they had done something different, if they had done it wrong in the eyes of um, the TVA, they would have been disappeared. TVA, yeah. Yeah, and I think that that's kind of the, the crux of it is that it's not necessarily doing something wrong it's doing something that creates one of those time branches and it's something that they talk about a little bit um in endgame um that they can't stay in any of those time you know they can't stay in those times they can't change too many things or they're going to screw everything up and they have to be very careful and like one of my biggest questions about this show is what does that mean for the steve rogers who goes back to the past to go get married to peggy yeah that's the Steve Rogers I don't want to think about because it's awful. Um, but yes, that is one of the questions that would raise. Um, I, I I actually also want to just think about like the the things that the timeline identifies as prune worthy sins or deviations, um, and you know, ranging from like tiny to large to just like I mean, basically queer phobic to being a girl yeah exactly to literally to being a girl I, I, they're just, i'm sorry there's like no other explanation for why they do this to sylvia as a small child um so i i, I do want to talk actually a bit about like how do we feel about e- the metaphorical as well as literal uh ways that the show attempts to or doesn't or shies away from uh handling or discussing queerness um you know fans have loki has Loki, the mythological being, has always been gender fluid. Loki, the character as they exist in comics, has been gender fluid for some time and has had big queer orientation vibes for some time as well, but was only recently acknowledged to be such in the comics. And now in the um, in the films, you know, in the in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, whatever. We have a moment where we saw that brief glimpse in the trailer of jo- of Loki's gender being listed as fluid before the camera flashed away. And then we had uh, an admonition, God, I fucking hate that word, um, of the two of, of Loki and Sylvie both, you know, not being not being monosexual um, uh, in, in this show and. Um, and then, of course, the whole internet has to go and have a big argument over whether XYZ is queerbaiting or XYZ is representation. Uh, and I think it's really easy to have a conversation around that that is reductive. And I'd like one of the reasons I was excited to have you guys on the show is that you're not going to do that. So <laughs> uh, do you guys want to share some thoughts about uh, because I we you know, we've often said that like having characters who are non-binary as part of their or gender fluid um as part of their existence as being a non-human being like loki's not a person loki's a god right like it's not the same as having representation of like just people humans folks like you or i who may be gender fluid non-binary or trans but um by the same token this is a character for whom having them be monosexual having them be um cis like just doesn't even make sense and so it's good that they have acknowledged that, even if it's in a way that it's just interesting how there's people out there who won't pick up on any of this. And that blows my mind. They'll just, the the, the heteronormative blinders are just that thick. Yeah, and that's actually what kind of in consuming what a lot of queer people were saying um, about this. And I, I definitely, there were very mixed feelings about it. I think that the fact that they recognized Loki as gender fluid, at least in, in that, uh, the description, <laughs> uh, and 
the conversation they had where they both opened up to the fact that they're bisexual or pansexual. Um, definitely a lot of people are like, yay, that's great. Um, and there's something good about it. Like I, I definitely am not in a, there's one right answer here camp. Um, and it is also mm-hmm. clear at the same time that the fact that it was played by um, a cisgender male actor and a cisgender female actor um, lends itself really easily for straight people at home to not really pick up on the queerness. So they're definitely, I think that there was a bit, whether this was intentional or not intentional, that kind of a having your cake and eating it too. Like here we have some queer representation finally in the MCU universe, but also it won't freak out the straight people. So for for instance, if you wanted to have Loki really gender fluid, then they could be together, but like maybe one of them changes their gender and the other one's okay with it. Right. <laughs> like that's <laughs> as a, as a, as a trans person, as a queer person, that's kind of what I think would be really exciting, but they don't want to do that because I think it's already, uh, I think it was already a lot for some people, the fact that this was a female Loki and what does that mean? A female Loki pairing with a male Loki. And then just the idea of actually having real gender fluidity or having real um, bi or pansexuality that doesn't look heterosexual to the people sitting at home watching um, yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree with Julia. Um, I feel like that was for me and I'm somebody who um, I would definitely present as gender fluid a lot of the time. And for me, that was really the the censure was there was a difference between having having different versions of yourself in different timelines being different genders is not gender fluidity. Um you know, and I think it's something that is handled really, really well in Loki, Agent of Asgard, um, where, you know, one of the things that happens over the course of that series um, is that there's um, there's a point where, and Loki, Agent of Asgard is actually a comic that has a bunch of different variants, for want of a better term, of Loki, and um, a younger Loki trying to not only fight an older Loki, but specifically fight an older Loki over his right, um, the younger Loki's right to chart his own course and tell his own story. And um, over the course of that, Loki ends up in a position where he gets to make a decision about his future and changes his title from God of Lies to not just god of stories but goddess of stories and part of part of changing into the loki that loki wants to be is becoming goddess of stories and using female pronouns and appearing female to everyone and so like to me that's what when i want gender fluid representation that's what i want to see i want to see the same character depicted as both male and female or some other gender that isn't determined by, you know, by binaries. Um, And they didn't really quite get there at the same time. Like I also feel like if you have two characters saying that they are bi or pansexual explicitly, and then they end up in a relationship with each other, even if they are what we call quote unquote opposite binary sexes, um, you know, that's the experience of many, many, many bi Uh and pan people. Um, And so that doesn't negate it being a queer experience. And I think that that's really, um, you know, so so I don't perceive that as queer baiting. I don't think that the show went quite as far as it could have. I, uh, Julia, you said something earlier about the male Lokis all being like, oh, a female Loki, that sounds terrifying. And like, to me, there should have been some female Lokis or they should have been like, of course, I turn yeah. into a lady all the time. You don't like. And so that's the part where I felt like they just didn't go far enough with it. But I also do think that it's not quite fair to call what we might call a quote unquote hetero relationship between two queer people. A hundred percent. Like, yeah, uh, as a bi person, I get pissed off when people imply that especially like since they've both actually had a conversation about both being queer and like, that's a queer relationship. 
that's clear. Um, I, I also suspect that Marvel wouldn't have let them be in a relationship with someone who didn't physically appear to be opposite gender is the problem. But that does not mean that they're not queer, even though they're together. I Like, a lot, lot of biphobia floating around in the ether, that is for sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I really love the idea of them as a couple. Like, I was 100% here for it. And um, Julie, uh, you talked a little bit about, I, you know, how people had a bit of a divided response to this particular relationship. I'd love to hear you talk about that. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, it was kind of interesting that this happened. I'm, I'm working on my next book and I was literally in the middle of writing and thinking about the way in which a lot of straight people, even though we talk about people being, um, way more LGBTQ plus friendly than they used to be and people being more accepting of trans people than they used to be certainly. But at the same time, (laughs) there is this idea that being with a queer person or being with a trans person, that that somehow disrupts your own sense of gender sexuality. And so as I, as I'm doing that, I was seeing a lot of the reaction to Loki and Sylvie, when it was clear that they had a connection, <laughs> a romance, uh, whatever. And people, I, I witnessed people, and this was a lot of times like listening to people on podcasts or watching, you know, YouTube videos about the show. And people were obviously having issues <laughs> with um, Loki and Sylvie potentially being a couple that it struck me that some of the people I was listening to um, didn't really, couldn't really put their finger on it, right? And I've since heard people, some people are like, oh, well, it's uh, weird to be attracted to yourself, right? And that's kind of a more theoretical thing because none of us will actually, maybe I'm wrong, but I don't think I'll ever actually be in an alternate timeline where I meet myself and I have the decision of whether or not to hook up with myself, right? But then other people were like mentioning incest. And I'm sure (laughs) incest for some people, maybe like is a real squick thing for them that they were really disgusted by that. But they're not siblings. They're not, they weren't family members. And so I think a lot of the reactions were um, essentially um unconscious transphobia and the way that i put it in my piece was that there is this um actual concept called gender essentialism and a lot of people in our world are gender essentialists and what essentialism means it's kind of a early childhood cognitive bias that sometimes stays with us in which um for particularly natural kinds things that we see as natural like dogs and cats and human beings and trees, we imagine that underneath there's some kind of underlying like dogness or catness um, that kind of makes certain entities dogs or cats. And this is not true, um, but it's something, it's a, a cognitive bias. And it comes up a lot of times in human beings, for example, of different races or ethnicities, or sometimes people are like, imagine like straight and gay people being completely different, having some kind of underlying essence. And it's definitely true for gender. A lot of times people think that like what separates men and women is there's, there has to be some kind of underlying essence there. And so basically what I talk about in my like really short piece was that the reactions to uh, people not liking the Loki and Sylvie um, coupling without being able to put their finger on it is that I think people think of Loki as having a male essence. And so when they think of Sylvie, they imagine Sylvie as being a male Loki who's transformed to female. And so it kind of plays on people's you know, unconscious transphobia or homophobia. So I'm not accusing people who don't like the romance of being outright transphobic. Uh, I'm just suggesting maybe people question kind of what is Mm -hmm. going on and whether there's some feeling that maybe that that is two different male characters getting together, even though one of them was played by a cis female actor. And yeah, to be clear, like, 
we exist in a world where we are taught heteronormativity and transphobia is in like the entire culture that we live in. So of course people are going to have absorbed some of that. It's not like, even if you don't want to be, it's internalized anyway. So it doesn't mean that we're saying you're a bad person, (laughs) just asking you to interrogate why that's squicking you a little and you know it's for me i assume people would not like the couple because they because of biphobia i assumed that they had their hearts set on like a very specific male male romance for loki and like god forbid some dirty stinky woman get in the way of that slash like you know um you know now it's bi erasure because sorry now it's queer erasure because i guess bi people don't exist so when you pointed out the the sort of ascent, the, the essentialism that people might be revealing by having, by having this distaste, I was like, ah, and that's another possible reason. Thank you. Yeah, you know, so like I, um, it was it was interesting for me because um, I'm not I'm not, like I'm not entirely sure what I think about them as a romantic pair. But um, I'm also one of those people where, like, I definitely, like, my husband and I have the conversation about, like, well, what would you do if you met your alternate universe self? And his answer is, I would definitely sit down and watch Speed Racer because there's no one else who will appreciate that movie as much as I would. And, like, I feel like that would probably be my, like, I'd be like, yes, you know, probably not Speed Racer, but I'd probably, like, sit down and, like, I'd want to find out like what 1930s comic strips existed in like my alternate self's mm-hmm. universe, right? So like, you know, and um and I feel like I feel like the thing though with Loki and it's I think a really important thing for and uh, maybe people who um who are squicked out by self-cest to uh to like come to terms with is that Loki would 100% be mm-hmm. into himself. He like it it, he, that's not even like the hundredth weirdest <laughs> thing he's been into. Yeah. So like, you know, like to me, I feel like, you know, it's, it's a little bit, you know, it's a little bit weird that you'd be like, no, no, Loki would never do that when it's like, yes, Loki would totally yeah. do that. Loki, Loki would, Loki did mm-hmm. a horse, you know, like, so it's, it's one of those, like, I mean, Loki's probably also into mm-hmm. alligator Loki. We have no idea. Um, but um yeah yeah you know i think like for me i didn't even really think of it as being a trans relationship and i i feel like part of that is because i already think of loki like i think of loki as this gender fluid character um and i don't there's this great panel i actually alana mm-hmm. i sent to you earlier um where loki runs into his dad odin and odin is like ah oh, my child who is both my son and my daughter and You know, and I think, like, that's really what Loki's essence is. And so when people try to, like, when people try, even when, you know, Disney slash Marvel try to, like, project a gender, a specific gender onto the character, I kind of have a really hard time with that. You know, folks, like, definitely check out that Loki series. It is very good. Um, And I don't think you need to be someone who's read a bajillion comics to appreciate it. Um, So... Really check out the Loki Asgard's Assassin series. It's probably available in a convenient compendium. But yeah, like Loki being in love with Loki's self is 100% the most in character thing Loki could possibly do. Um, and in this case, he gets to be with someone who's not just himself, but himself, uh, who's had some interesting experiences and skills that he hasn't had. I mean, I I do have a bit of a question, though, as to does Marvel know what gender fluid is? Like, were were they confusing (laughs) gender fluid with bi? Are they like, what is happening? Um, But like, yes, Loki is gender fluid, even though I think you might have met bisexual, I guess. Who knows what you know? Like, this is like talking to someone from the Stone Age past. I mean, the thing is that when you have a Loki in the comics who is explicitly gender fluid, um, it's a little bit hard to, you know, you... Marvel clearly knows what gender fluidity is because they have presented the character that way mm-hmm. in books. Um, but in the context of this show, it almost feels like they put it on that thing as like a little hint that there was going to be a girl Loki showing up without thinking about kind of the impact of not actually having a fluid Loki mm-hmm. on the show. Yeah, yeah, I- that sounds about right to me. 
Yeah, in, th- in thinking about it, I, I think people tend to blur the idea of being bisexual and pansexual with the idea of being like gender fluid or androgynous. And I kind of think of it in terms of binaries. Like if you're really sure that there's a male-female binary, then you sort of lump together everyone who doesn't quite fit into that binary. And I think also people tend to adhere to like, oh, you're either heterosexual or you're homosexual, which lumps anybody who doesn't neatly fall into those categories. Um, I mean, they're obviously asexual people as well, but people who are, are sexual that don't neatly fall into the hetero homo binary, people just imagine them all as being kind of like an amorphous group of bisexual, pansexual people. And I think people tend to kind of, people who are less aware tend to confuse those together. Now, whether the writers were doing that, I don't know. And I'd imagine that the writers probably at least did enough research if they don't have the personal experience to know that, okay, well, there's obviously a difference between being bisexual and being gender fluid. But I think they were also writing a story within the constraints of, A, it has to be something that Disney will be okay with. And also, um, you know, there are definitely some issues that can arise, particularly when people have very gender sensualist ideas. Like what if they did make Loki gender fluid and just say one episode instead of um, it being Tom Hiddleston, it was a female character, a female actor playing the same character. That would really throw off a lot of people because Mm -hmm. of our views of gender. Um, even though I think I and T, um, and, and you, Alana, I think all of us would probably be like, oh, that's cool. <laughs> but I think for some audiences, yeah, it'd be yeah. weird. It would seem like a completely different character to them. Whereas for some of us, we would be like, oh, that would be really cool gender fluid writing. But yeah, it's weird that when we had all the alternate Lokis, you know, there, there was only, she's the only one who presented herself as being a woman. I mean, Alligator Loki, we have literally no idea about what's going on behind those green, green eyes. But um, Alligator Loki is also the greatest thing that's ever happened. I just... Uh, Alligator Loki is very good. I was a little bit bothered by the fact that when the, like, main lo- like that their little cadre of main Lokis went off to fight Elias at the end, that Alligator Loki got to go... But yep. the one black Loki yep. didn't. That was a little bit. That was a little bit frustrating to me, especially since that was yeah. such a great character. Um, and I was so curious. I was really curious about that particular Loki too, because like he had a hammer, and I was yeah. like, "That's a yeah. Thor weapon. Yeah. What's going on? I want the backstory for this character." And they just I mean, kind the, of also calling him boastful Loki. Like I that. Uh, versus all the other Lokis who are so humble, right? Like, no, <laughs> all Lokis are boastful. So <laughs> that's not really like, and yeah, he has got a, he's got a hammer. He may have actually killed his brother and taken his hammer. Like that would definitely be, you know, a, a, a specific life path where that would have changed things for Loki. Um, you know, the actor I thought was great, very charismatic. And, you know, and why was there only one black Loki? There, there should have been just a, you know, you, you could have Loki, President Loki, which is fun to see President Loki show up and be particularly evil because that's a new thing from, from the comics. But, um, yeah, like I, I think also just on a race level, I felt like there was some stuff in this that was a little, I mean, I'm white and I don't feel qualified to speak to it. And I, I've been trying to find some critical work perspective from black critics to like who are talking about it. I haven't seen stuff. So folks send it my way if you see it. Um, I know that there's an interest, but yeah, the, like the, that, that, that the black Loki is the one who's like boastful Loki and is gone. Is like, ugh. um, as to, lo- as to Loki being an alligator, I, there's just something beautifully absurd about that specifically, but also, you know, f- Thor, because Thor gets turned into a frog in the comics. And, you know, this is surely a thing that happens in the mythology as well. But this alligator Loki is potentially just literally, and on this world, Loki was an alligator. And you have to think about what an alligator would have done in the earlier Avengers movies. Well, and then there's also the question of, okay, why is Loki an alligator? Are all the Asgardians alligators in that universe? Like, or that timeline or whatever we're calling them? Like, 
you, the, I want to know so much more about those alternate Lokis because um, it's just, it's so interesting. There's another a line from Asian of Asgard that I really love where um, Loki is talking about, and talking about not just gender fluidity, but like presentational fluidity across a lot of lines and says, you know, um, I can change into, I th- I don't remember what the exact line is, but it's something along the lines of as I can change into me. anything as yep. long as it's myself. And it's just such a great line. And so the idea that like there can be any permutation of Loki, and that's kind of what frustrated me is that they've got the alligator Loki there, but literally like Sylvie's the yeah. only lady and there's one black Loki. There should be so many Lokis that are so many different things because Loki can be anything as long I as I do want to shout out, um, it was nice to see the very much like Journey and uh, Kieran Gillen, Doug Braithwright, you know, Stephanie Hans, like Loki Journey into Mystery Era looking child Loki uh, make an appearance here because that's clearly where that costume came from. That kid's performance was great. And then Richard E. Grant, holy fuck with Nell and I like, what an amazing casting coup. Um, and it was wonderful seeing him just pour it on a lot of pathos there and enjoying the old school costume as well. Yeah, what's interesting about that specific kind of trio where I, obviously there's alligator Loki thrown in, but the um, the the scene in Agent of Asgard, there's where where Loki has to make the decision about what Loki's going to become in the future is specifically a scene where Loki is pulled into a void, similar to this one, um, and is confronted by the classic Loki and the kid Loki. And those are the two people who are there when Loki has to make the decision about what Loki is going to be and whether Loki is going to follow in the footsteps of the old Loki or go on to be something new. Yeah, yeah. I I really hope that they get some credit and money for the people who worked on those earlier stories. Uh Um, I also think that like possibly one of the most Loki things that happened in the show was Loki freeing the goat and connecting with the goat. Pompeii flashback. Like, of course it's a goat. They got horns together. Um, It filled me with joy. I think there's definitely a lot of playfulness in the series mixed in with like real pathos and lots of character conversations. Um, I myself am not a Doctor Who fan per se, but I know enough Doctor Who to say, oh, this is a, this, they're doing a Doctor Who bit um, in this series. And it's interesting because there's moments where the show felt very expensive and high budget and moments where it felt a little bit less so. And when it felt less so, it felt even more Doctor Who to me. Are either of you guys like Doctor Who people? No. Yeah, I mean, I've seen a few episodes, but I've never really been super into the show. Yeah, like with me. I mean, so I, that it seems like there's consensus that that was an influence too, but I especially thought some of the stuff with the score really called that to mind for me. Oh, that's interesting. I think, though, Doctor Who is a really good example of what Julia was talking about before with just the absolute sort of repulsion that people have connected to this kind of gender essentialism Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, because you have this genderless immortal time jumping character who when they first cast an actress to play the character instead of a male actor people completely freaked out and it's literally the same character it's part of the mythos of doctor who that it's the same character and yet people just could not deal. Yeah, it it, it 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 made no sense for Doctor Who to be played by male actors this whole time. Ridiculous. And um, yeah, people are backwards a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, speaking of people being backwards, can we talk about the class war train? As I put it in my notes, um, the whole episode three, like, I, I haven't seen Snowpiercer, but definitely felt like... Oh, it was very Snowpiercer. Yeah, like they're on a train... Only the rich people get to go on the train. They have to lie to get on it. It's how the rich people believe they're using it to escape their world. And much like the real rich people on this world, if they think they're going to get to escape the world without the rest of us, they've got another thing coming. Um, it just was extremely prescient and timely to have the story where there's an end of the world happening. The rich people think they're getting off the planet. But actually, we're all in this shit together. 
And I, 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 I love that whole sequence. The costumes with the rich people on the train, the guards keeping people apart. And then the fact that once they'd infiltrated the train themselves, they stopped getting policed as much because, well, if you're here, you're supposed to be here. It's very apt. Yes. I One of the things about that whole sequence, so there's a couple things about that sequence. The thing that I just really want to know is because we had already at that point learned that it was pretty much impossible to have um, to have a nexus event in a cataclysm. Right. And so I want to know what was, what they changed. Obviously, like, yes, we know that like what changed about them was feelings, but I'm so curious about what changed on Lamentus one, what was going to happen differently on the planet because Loki and Sylvie had feelings Mm. Um, because something had to have changed for there to be a Nexus event. Um, And one, and then the other really interesting thing about that is that that's actually a seat. It's a sequence that is referencing a sequence from, Oh, let me see if I wrote down the name of the comic it's referencing. Um, it's sequencing a, um, a referencing a story from um, Annihilation Conquest. Um, Lamentus is a Cree out world, and um, that is being destroyed. And so, in the comics, we see Moon Dragon and Philovel um, kind of facing the potential destruction of this Cree out world, and they end up coming across a ship of dead Cree. Um, just thousands of dead Cree, and I keep thinking, oh, is that supposed to be the shuttle that never made it, right? That, you know, the one that we see in there. Um, but it was really cool to see that, you know, as like essentially referencing an event that happened in the comics, but seeing it from this other perspective. Speaking of events that happened in the comics, I lost my mind when I saw the Thanos copter. Um because that's so deeply absurdist. But, and the fact that anybody is aware of there having ever been a Thanos copter is purely the product of internet humor. <laughs> so, like, yes. prior to that becoming an internet meme, I assure you most people were unaware of the whole, like, Thanos helicopter, which is ridiculous in and of itself kind of thing. Um, but that brought me great joy. Although, let's, we haven't, we haven't talked about the scene that Sif has with Loki. Um, when Mobius throws him in a time loop to experience a moment of pain and shame that he's had, but it's also, I think, a moment that he chooses thinking that this is going to teach Mo- Loki a lesson. Like, what do you guys think about that scene and that approach to getting through to him? I mean, <laughs> I sort of had dark thoughts about that um, just uh, sometime in reading it through... Uh, the lens of being a trans person, being a queer person in a world where there's a long history of conversion therapy, where you just basically force people over and over again to like, you know, through negative and positive reinforcement. Um, that just struck me as, as horrible. <laughs> um, like if it, if it, if it, in this case, if it had a, a the possibility of of Loki realizing, oh, I've I've done bad or this is wrong, maybe I should be more like this. In in the the context of the show, it definitely wasn't like he was tortured into doing something he didn't want to do, but it was essentially a, a little torture loop. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, it well, and and I think to your point, it wasn't really the thing that you choose if you were really trying to get somebody to learn something about themselves because like he cut Sif's hair and so there's it it kind of felt like you know he's done all kinds of terrible things he's done things that have deeply deeply hurt people one and one of the things that I really wanted them to kind of address on the show that they didn't was the fact that this isn't the Loki from Infinity War. This is the Loki from Avengers. This is the Loki that just commit tried to commit genocide. Yeah, that just got called a Nazi by an by a Holocaust survivor, also. Right, and he just tried to commit genocide, and I felt like in a lot of ways they portrayed him as somebody who'd gone through learning all of the things 
that the Loki that we know who went through Ragnarok learned. Um, you know, because I think he's a character who has had tremendous growth within the MCU universe, but this isn't the version of that character who had that growth. And then the thing that they bring up is the, oh, that time you cut Sif's hair and she kicked you in the nuts. Like, that's the thing that they're torturing him with. Um, and I think it's kind of because he didn't really have anything that he regretted at that point. Um, all of the things he's seen that happened to his family, he didn't actually experience. Yeah, the, the, it, in addition to like, yeah, the disproportionateness of like, we're going to give you the scene where you, you cut Sif's hair rather than this, you know, <laughs> attack on the planet Earth, this potential genocide that you like helped create. Um, in addition to that, just it was really the the fact that it's a loop when you put people on a little loop like that you don't learn a life lesson you just learn how to get out of the loop and so it was kind of a little bit weird that he comes out of it seeming to have grown but if any of us was in a loop like that we would just learn how to get out of the loop <laughs> yeah i think that's that sounds true um it was there's moments of real kind of cruelty and fucked upness from Agent Mobius that I think is really easy to miss because Owen Wilson is just pathologically charming. That's what he does. Um, I mean, Mobius mocking Loki for falling in love with himself, for example, like is totally, I think, deliberately trying to call up, you know, recall homophobia um, when he's teasing him in that way. And I think that also like, He's also jealous, like Mobius is jealous that Loki has that closeness with someone else, since he's clearly like someone who's trying to find friends himself. What do you think about people from the timeline who are pruned ending up in that void rather than just being literally like dead? Yeah, I mean, it seems like, um, yeah, it seems like a very horrible fate to, to, yeah, it seems like a very horrible fate to me. Like, I'd rather be pruned and just disappear than like, be on what seems to be like a planet S type thing with a giant smoke monster that's eventually going to consume me. Yeah, it felt like it sort of, um, I think, recall some of the conversations we were having earlier talking about kind of the fascism of the TVA and the, you know, the government bureaucracy aspect. And, you know, I know, you know, Julia was bringing up, uh, you know, how the sort of um, echoes of, um, the carceral state and it's that same sort of feeling where, you know, and I think it, it almost in some ways kind of goes into some, I, you know, some um, kind of like religious orthodoxy in some ways, because it's that whole idea that Renslayer says, you know, well, you know, they're working on a, they're, they're working on a utopia <laughs> And this whole idea that the the TVA is kind of just, it seems like some people know that people are getting pruned and sent to this void. And they're like, well, it's okay, because eventually it's going to be a utopia. We're doing something good for them by doing this. Um, we're putting them somewhere where they can't get hurt and they can't hurt anybody. And someday it's going to be a utopia. But oh, in the meantime, there's like a giant monster that eats you. Yeah, and that's literally real old fascist ideology of like, sending people to prison camps for being deviants. Um, I think that the show was pretty deliberate in making that choice. I, I, but I also think that like it, it really shows that there's a lot of fake control where they like to pretend that they have, that they have perfect knowledge of what's happening. They like to pretend that everything is under control, but it's truly not because it's impossible for that to be the case. And there's always going to be cracks and spaces for people who are fighting for freedom against the systems. And they don't acknowledge that they're real because they'd like you to believe that there's a closed loop of control that they have around everything. Um, so I think that the people are getting sent to like this chaotic planet that they don't really know what's happening on it is, you know, a pretty apt illustration of the fact that they're not actually all knowing all being the whole, like, Wizard of Oz, actually, there's no one behind the curtain thing that happens was incredibly predictable. Uh, I do not mean that as a criticism. Like, I think that was the correct choice. But the whole time I'm like, oh, I mean, it's clearly there's not going to be they're not going to have three actual all knowing timekeepers um, with really neat Jack Kirby reference designs. No, it's not. It's going to be very Wizard of Oz. And I'm, I'm glad that they went in that direction. Um, 
So one of the questions we got from our listeners was, um, since season two has been announced and queer director Kate Heron is not coming back, what what do you all hope to see in regards to Loki's bisexuality and gender fluidity and other representation, both on and off screen? And I think we've hit on some parts of that, but I don't think we've really talked about the specific impact of Kate Heron as a, as a queer director working on the series. And, and when I heard that, we don't know who's going to be directing series two and like, chances are it's going to be some straight person. I'm a little bit not feeling so hot about it. So I feel like for me, when you see that Kate Heron talks about having to really fight to get Mm -hmm. literally one line of dialogue that acknowledges that Loki is and or has been attracted to people of multiple genders, um, that, and that's, that's what she had to fight for. And it, it, to me, in a lot of ways, like, I'm really happy it's there, but it's the equivalent of, like, every once in a while, you'll be, like, watching, like, like a teen movie, and, like, one of the teen characters' parents will be like, oh, yeah, I had some kind of bisexual experience when I was in college, and it's supposed to be very progressive, and then the movie just keeps doing its thing. Like, it was the equivalent of that, and that's what she had to fight for. Um You know, and I think we live in a place where, you know, we live in a time where we're seeing like genuinely groundbreaking, exciting queer representation in a lot of television um, and a lot, you know, like in in all kinds of genres. And I feel like they could be, you know, they could be doing a lot better. I'm hoping that they'll find another queer director. I'm hoping that they might have some folks in their writer's room who really push for more representation. I think we kind of talked about what we'd like to see. And I, I still feel the same. I think that I'd like to see more Lokis of more different genders. I'd like to see Lokis that start out as one gender being portrayed as a different gender later. Uh, you know, I'd like to see trans and non-binary binary actors yeah. being cast in those roles. So that would kind of be my, uh, my wish list. Yeah, I, I think a lot about how um, just in general, I think the amount of queer acceptance in the culture and in the media, and especially once you start getting to really, uh, you know, giant creators like Disney, um, that there's there's always limits. It just really strikes me when I see positive queer characters um, on TV or in movies. Very often, they're very... Uh, platonic or chase like we don't really get into the queerness they're like in a straight world and they act Mm straightish enough that you know they don't really bother anybody um so i i would imagine for loki too unless i would love to be surprised i would imagine that they'll probably just keep with what they have which is the idea that um at least in name uh, Loki and Sylvie are gender fluid and that they made a connection and will probably um, they could potentially be like a bisexual gender fluid couple who's together um, which is great because even if you look straight but you're gender fluid or you're bisexual you're queer um, and some people will definitely appreciate mm-hmm. that aspect out of it but also at the same time I don't think that they're going to do anything to queer it up even more yep that's where i am on it like i feel like the i my prediction for the quote-unquote like gay couple in like the upcoming eternals movie is going to be it's going to be just as staid and square and sexless lack of developed etc as it was in that star trek movie you know like i do not have high hopes and it is ridiculous 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 um, I honestly, it's really hard to get as enthusiastic as I'd like to be given that, frankly. And you see so many cases of creators and actors and performers and everybody just struggling against the system. They're trying to tell these stories. The audience is trying to hear them. And corporate is just retrograde, homophobic, you know, anti-Black and all the rest, so. Your last comment, Alana, uh, reminded me, I, and you know, it, it's a shout out and I have, to, I have to admit I have a connection because my husband was one of the co-writers of it, but for folks who really want to see um, 
good queer mm-hmm. Loki rep. Uh, I highly recommend uh, listening and or reading um, Thor Metal Gods. It's a um, it's a serial box audio novel um, that is it, it's. In name, it's a Thor book, but Loki is a major character in it. There are several other major characters, um, it you know, and other queer characters in it as well. Um, and it's it's delightful and um, and deals with some of the same concepts that you see in Ragnarok around um, around colonialism and things like that. So, I do think that like it, it's again, it's a case where I know the creators worked really hard to. Uh, depict queer relationships in ways that were okay with a um, with a corporate structure that that needed that had a certain you know certain confines on that. But, but I think it it turned out great and it's a really entertaining story. So highly recommend. Um, in addition to Agent of Asgard, which does have an explicitly um, queer gender fluid Loki in it. I love it. It sounds really fun. Um, so folks should definitely check that out as well as that recent. Well, ish, recent-ish, a Loki Agent of Asgard series written by Al Ewing with a, a handful of different cool artists. Um, so with that in mind, uh, where can our listeners keep up with your work, Julia? Yeah, um, so my website is juliasereno.com. Uh, and there you can find I most of what I do is writing-related. Um, I have a writings page that I literally comprehensive list of all my online stuff, all my books. Um, I also do music on the side as well. So that's where you can find out about everything. I love it. And like, seriously, listeners, like Whipping Girl is like a must read book for people in the world. So you should go and read that and be informed and inspired. Um, And T, where can folks keep an eye on your work online? Uh, you can pretty much find me on every social media platform at T Berry Blue. That's T like the drink, berry like the fruit, blue like the color. And uh, if you're ever interested in learning more about lots of old comics, I occasionally blog on comicskingdom.com. And uh, you had Popeye, who is non-binary, wishing us a very happy non-binary day. Yes. Pa- well, Popeye, I would say non-binary is kind of it's the wrong term because it's a mm-hmm. much newer term. Than uh, Popeye, who was uh, talking about being amphibious in 1934. (laughs) But it was it was a great greeting to have from from Popeye for a non-binary day. And as for me, who does want to leave you with one thought I just had, which was like, what does it say that the entire Marvel universe itself has been presented as being a possible autocracy? Like, if we look at that as possibly meta commentary on the Marvel universe itself, um. I think that is probably significant and interesting. I am on Twitter a little bit too much at E-L-A-N-A underscore Brooklyn. That's Elana underscore Brooklyn. Uh, come back soon. We'll be having Black Widow movie coverage as well as our usual interviews with awesome guests uh, in comics, thinkers, etc. And a new episode of Deep Space Dive, my Deep Space Nine podcast, will be joining us very soon as well. So Graphic Policy, we're on every podcast platform you can possibly think of, uh, graphicpolicy.com. And uh, as we like to say, keep it geeky. Hey, thanks for watching the previous video from Graphic Policy Television. Just by watching, you help support our site. Thank you so much. Now, if you're watching these videos, you probably care about geeky things like movies, television, comic books, toys, games, video games, you name it. You can go and subscribe right now to our YouTube channel to stay in touch and catch all the new videos, or check out our website at graphicpolicy.com. There's a nice link on this end of the video. But as always, thank you for watching. Keep on rocking and keep it geeky.